Thank you everyone for uh, joining. Uh, uh, please keep the session uh, interactive as uh, suggested and I presume uh, collectively we'll be trying to monitor the chat and the Q&A uh, as you uh, type in your questions. Uh, what my hope today in this session is to tell you a little bit about uh, what and why no code AI. Uh, so, what is no code AI, at least at the highest level, and why sort of no code AI can be helpful to grow from data to actions? And this is particularly interesting in current time as we're becoming data rich and we have a collection of systems that have been built. So, really, this is uh, kind of the last layer. It almost feels like early 90s where, you know, personal computers just came around and people started using things like spreadsheet and emails to do things. So it's very similar uh, situation now. We've got data and we've got lots of infrastructure, but now we want to use something like uh, spreadsheet-like skills to do things with it. And that's where I think no code AI comes in. Uh, so with that, um, let me just sort of uh, briefly tell you a little bit about uh, myself, how I came to this, and then sort of dive into uh, the session itself. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm a professor uh, at MIT uh, since uh, 2005, so close to uh, 17, 18 years now. Uh, among other things, as a part of my academic journey at MIT, uh, I had a distinct honor and a pleasure uh, to be founding director of academic unit in statistics and data science. This might surprise to some of you that MIT did not have statistics and data science unit till this recency. Um, and uh, that was a fantastic journey for me. As I went through that journey, one of the things uh, I felt, uh, not just as, a, as an academic and researcher, but realized the importance and value of uh, education in statistics and data science, or now more broadly AI, that is needed to be brought to uh, masses. Talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, on my way, uh, post tenure uh, in 2012-13, for spending some time at uh, uh, Netflix, I founded a company called Select, where we built primarily predictive analytics tech for retail, and we built point sold point solutions on top of it. Over uh, over years, my passion uh, has converged currently to bringing everything we call AI to people. That is, how do we uh, not just educate, but also help them use the AI at the uh, uh, in their day to day lives. So the analogy that sort of I like to use it's rather simplistic, but hopefully useful. It's the following: um, so I got eight year old daughter. Uh, she um, uh, she's still trying to learn her long form division, but she knows how to do uh, multiplication and she broadly understands what division means. Uh, that is, if she brings uh, a nine friends at home and she has 27 cookies and she wants to decide how many cookies should she give to each of her friend, she would know that she has to do 27 divided by nine. Uh, doing that division might be a little difficult for her but she can actually uh, use her iPad and uh, she knows a division sign and she gets answer three and then that she uses it. So really in my mind, AI, to bring everything called AI to people, we need to, to do those two things. That is make people understand what AI can or cannot do. And second is provide them the iPad and the division sign so that people can, once they understand what they need to do, they can actually do it by clicking uh, meaningful things. And that's primarily, those are the two pillars uh, and two uh, things that I've been spending all my time uh, as I think about this, uh, my primary passion. Uh, in particular, at MIT, we've developed this program called MicroMasters. It's like a one-year master's program in statistics and data science. Uh, it's all MIT level courses, the way MIT teaches it, but open to everyone. Um, as an alumni network and all those stuff. So if you have not uh, looked at it, please go take a look at it. It's uh, available at a very cost-effective manner. It's rigorous, it's a lot of work. Uh, so it's like a fire hose, but it is, uh, it is available. So if you can do it, uh, you, can, uh, you have access to it. 
In addition, uh, there are more simpler version of things, uh, shorter time scale, um, uh, less you fire host style courses. Also, I teach uh, uh, through variety of uh, online forums um, on primarily common theme of no code AI. Okay, so that's uh, where I'm spending my time in terms of education uh, towards this and in terms of uh, tools. And we, for a while, we looked at tools all around and and we concluded that really to build a tool like that, a new technology was needed. And once that technology is there, an end-to-end -to -end tool is needed. And the one way to do that as an academic is to build an open source, but open source cannot be maintained. So this has to be done uh, commercially and that's where uh, we decided to start a company called Ikikai Labs, where uh, I'm proud to say that after uh, close to three years of journey, we built a mature tool, um, which now is uh, slowly uh, penetrating the market. And so if you want to give it a try, um, I'll give you the links by the end of the uh, talk, or you can just go to ikikailabs.com and just try it yourself for free. Okay. So with that as a context, uh, first, let me just tell you what do I really, it's all about bringing everything called AI to people and from the perspective of using that to make insightful decisions, insightful data-driven decisions. So to do that, what I want to do briefly is just talk to you about a little bit of history of AI, what it meant when, in the, uh, when it was founded and what it should mean today what are the great challenges beyond just chat GPTs? Uh, what are the great challenges that sort of we need to uh, think about, we need to worry about, and how snow code tools can help address those challenges? The way I think about it is AI is for the people and has to be by the people. Chat GPTs are not the ultimate solution. They're great tools towards making some of those things easier and feasible. All right. So with that, let's go back to a little bit of uh, history of AI. So the term was coined in the um, 1960s, uh, and again, sort of with a, a very simple uh, mission that the goal of AI is to mimic human intelligent behavior. Okay, it was coined uh, as a name in uh, uh, one of the manuscripts that was wrote by Marvin Minsky and his collaborators. Uh, in that manuscript, for example, uh, Minsky and his collaborators went ahead and said that, well, machines will be capable within 20 years of doing everything that a man or now a woman or a human can do. And, uh, you know, I'm still waiting for those 20 years and potentially will continue, uh, keep waiting for those 20 years to come. But bottom line is that while it's been uh, exciting, uh, endeavor and challenge, a lot can be done and a lot has, can, uh, may not be done, okay? So just taking a layer aside, if you think of mimicking human behavior in an intelligent manner, what that means is that, well, if uh, you can drive cars, machine should be able to drive cars and maybe well, like self-driving car, you play games, machine should be able to play games well, uh, maybe, uh, 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 Alpha goes zero from a deep mind. Uh, you can provide customer support. Machine should be able to provide customer support. There are these chatbots that have been there and now there's even a lot more uh, exciting uh, chatbot or general human support uh, through a large language model like chat GPTs. Um, at some level, if one thinks about what AI, at least traditionally it was trying to do, it's trying to do two things. One is to have mind and muscle, mind and muscle of human. Um, muscle is like automation mechanics, traditionally part of what one called robotics. Mind is where you're trying to learn from data, which is machine learning statistics. And historically people used rules or decision trees to make decisions, okay? And that's how sort of at least AI has continued to evolve. Now, these are great challenges, but in my mind, one of the biggest challenge of AI is helping people to use AI. What do I mean by that? Okay, so let's think of uh, uh, the following more uh, precise challenge. How do we bring automation within organization using the AI and data? And of course, computation is a substrate. 
if you think from think of this as a challenge it's not about replacing humans in my mind it's about enabling humans what do i mean by that okay and that's why i say to it's about by the people and for the people rather than replacing the people okay um one way to think about automation in organizations is making organizations productive by enabling individuals why do i mean why do i say that well i mean at the highest level organizations uh one way to think about it is for profit organization is a financial instrument take uh, you put 100 dollars uh, to run an organization and if that organization makes you uh 2 dollars a month that's 24% returns great if it makes you 2 dollars a year that's 2% returns maybe take the money out and put it into snp because some other people know how to run businesses better okay so really if we think from that perspective really what we want to do is we want to enable individuals to make them better uh, organizations um and in that sense we want people to have ability to think about how do they improve the return on investments using ai and data um highest level if you think about organize operations within organizations uh there are all sorts of uh, operations uh one way to one very coarse way to divide operations in organization is think of operations in front office operations in back office uh front office like you know marketing sales customer support uh back office supply chain accounting and then so there's a human resources which is all over in organization and many other things that one has to worry about these operations primarily are run by people people who have skills people who have experience people collaborate many of these operations if not all are collaborative a running organization is a team sport it's not an individual sport they run with people's instinct and their passions okay so what we really want to do is we want to enable such individuals to make operations better okay operations better with uh ultimate goal of getting better return on investment now to describe this um, and then we want to bring ai into it so really the goal that i have set up for us here is that we want to operate organizations better using ai the way organizations are at the end of the day run by people so one way to do that is to enable people to use ai okay so now the question is that how do we do that how do we enable people to use ai and data to run organizations better with the ultimate goal of making them better uh better financial instruments okay let me take one very concrete example of inventory ops in retail and i'm going to take extremely simple example to make the point that example will help us understand how how ai and data can help achieve this goal and then sort of we'll discuss to operationalize that we will have to use something like no code ai okay so really that's my plan for the rest of the talk so i'm going to walk you through a very simple example of how does one think about uh making a retail ops or inventory operations in retail um a better financial instrument using ai and data and then sort of as we go through that process we'll talk about how does sort of uh, a no code tool can help and then finally i'll show you an example uh, outcome of what you would be able to build with something like uh, a no code tool like ifal apps okay so really those are the sort of the three things that i want to do in the remainder of the talk uh, i see that sort of there are no uh, questions or comments that are coming out on either q and a or uh, on the chat so i'm going to continue but if you have questions comment feel free to sort of uh, put into the one of these online settings okay so there was a nice uh, 25 second zoom pause um and since there's no questions i shall move forward okay so for explaining this example i want you to imagine as somebody who is running a shoe shop in manhattan okay so you have a shop you are an owner of the shop and you are running this shop in manhattan and think of this as 1960s and 70s okay um 
if it's in 1960s and 70s, what would happen is that um, you are the owner of the shop. You will you have to make one operational decision every day, and that decision is that do you have enough shoes on your shelf to sell to your customers? Okay. If you don't have enough, if you feel like, then you will decide somehow some number of shoes you want to order for replenishment so that they come in in time so that your shelf is not empty. So that a walk customer who comes in does not find an empty shelf, uh, shelf and sort of disappears and you're not able to sell well. Okay. So how do you make this decision? Well, uh, at the highest level, because you're in 1960s and 70s, you're simply using your uh, real world channel, no virtual channels. You're talking to people, uh, you are looking at the shelf, you're seeing what's uh, what's selling, what's not selling. You're keeping track of all of these things through things like, you know, paper ledgers, you know, the classical things. You make entry on the left, you may make entry on the right when things get sold, and that's how you keep match and continue like that. Okay, that's how you continue to reconcile what is your current inventory and so on and so forth. So really it's very manual, laborious, and you know, not everybody is so perfect. If you have lots of customers, busy, you're not able to make entries and you forgot at the end of the day. It's incomplete. Okay. Uh, and that's why you could not scale your business. Uh, you really had to uh, run your shop in a small amount. And unless you had a really sharp instinct and you were on top of things, the businesses were, um, were sort of suffering. Okay. Then what happened? Well, then came computers. Computers came and at least one part of this became easy. So think of 80s, 90s. IT systems started becoming sort of available. That means that at least you could keep track of your, uh, your shop's uh, information literally better. No more papers to worry about. Okay. Um, maybe if you have a shop in New York and Chicago, you could keep track of that too. Uh, you had a shop in New York, you had a shop in Chicago, you can sort of merge information and all that. While you might have to send floppy disk, but still you could do that. Okay, so this is a huge step forward. Okay. Um, and then, um, you know, once you have a data in one place, uh, I would call business intelligence came in. Think of uh, circa 2000. People said, well, now that we have data, what are we going to do? Well, let's uh, understand trends. Let's understand uh, profit margin. Let's understand some kind of a turn information. That is, how often is a product sold from your shelf? that will help you sort of determine what are the good products to invest in, what are not good products to invest in. And this is where I'll say, well, on average, um, number of product selling uh, per day is three. So three shoes are selling. And today I'm looking at my shelf and my shelf has uh, less than 30 uh, shoes, which means I've got less than 10 days of inventory and typically it takes eight days for shipping to come in. Maybe this is a good day for me to order new shipment. And how many? Well, I want to order for one month, which is 30 times three, which is 90, and I will go and do that. And that's, that's now sort of a little nicer. So now I was been able to sort of figure out a rule that every, every time amount of inventory that's less than 10 days, order 30 days worth. Why 10, why 30? I'm not 100% sure. A few things that have driven me, but I'm not 100% sure. And but at least I know sort of what 10 would look like and what 30 would look like by looking at average sale over last year. The problem is that the way demand of customers work it varies over time. It's a different in fall. It's different in spring. It's different in Diwali. It's different in uh, Christmas time. So given that, I would really like to have a better information. Maybe that's where machine learning comes in. And uh, that's what sort of came as the next wave. That is, let's try to use machine learning demand forecasting. And all of this was happening and we're all gearing up and that's when sort of something uh, unbelievable happened, something disruptive happened. Not just COVID, but actually more broadly, retail became omni-channel as one calls it. There's people started selling online and in store, okay? And especially as we, now you think about online, the previous facility that we had of talking to customers, looking at shelf, it's all disappeared. Now everything is data. 
And data may not be in a one common place because you're selling, selling on different channels. You're selling uh, through uh, uh, different online portals and your own physical stores and many other places. And that means that you've got hundreds, uh, tens to hundreds of different data sources in which information about your operation lives. And this makes it really, really hard because now you have to, to bring them back in one place. Effectively, you're back to paper-like setting, but now through spreadsheets. You've got multiple spreadsheets and you're trying to uh, stitch them together daily to make uh, get the ground truth. Because this is the situation, you're not able to do trend analysis, profit margin, and all of that. Make it even worse. If you are an, um, uh, somebody selling apparel, let's think of a jacket that I'm wearing. It's a very typical black jacket, okay? Or a typical uh, gray shirt. You might be selling that every season, but every season to keep the season separate, you might call it by a different name. Last season, you might call this shirt uh, number one, two, three. This season, you might call it number ABC. Okay. So there's no way to easy way to stitch such an information together. And since this shirt, as it's going out in market, was never sold before, there's no way for me to figure out what would be its forecast. The only thing I have is this shirt last year. Okay. And the last year's data I have, but I can't use it for this year because I can't stitch the information. It's called skew mapping problem. Okay. So there are these first order information problem, information is all over. Then you want to do something meaningful with it. And then you want to make decisions. And all of these things you want to do in one uh, collaborative way without sort of uh, spending ton of money because otherwise it will be uh, a waste of resources and time. And this is where no code AI enters, okay? So to make uh, things more precise, as we've gone through this, at least uh, a little bit of narration of simple example, but hopefully what I've convinced you is that to make a simple decisions, simple decisions like how many shoes to order on any given day for a shoe store or somebody who runs uh, inventory operations with an eye on return on investment is really hard, okay? Uh, and that is because first, we don't know what the ground truth is. And the reason we don't know what the ground truth is is because typically data would live in many different sources. Once data stuff is in many different sources, you still have to connect to them, bring them into one place. Even if you manage to bring them into one place, you still have to stitch them. And that's not straightforward. Once you understand how much inventory you have, you want to decide how much inventory you should order. And let's suppose that for some reason, your friend or your, uh, your team in operations or somehow you guys have come to a conclusion that every time when there is 10 days worth of inventory left on shelf, you should order 30 days worth of inventory. Question is that what is 10 days worth of inventory and what is 30 days worth of inventory? You have to do good forecasting. Once you do good forecasting, once you look at what you have available, then you might be able to make uh, take that decision. This requires doing some advanced analytics, understanding trends yourself visually, manually, reconcile those things with the forecast that might be made because, because of certain changes, things might have changed. So you want a human expert with additional side information to maybe do a little bit of adjustment. And so this loop continues. Once those forecasts are done, they say, well, for next 10 days, the demand is 100 shoes. And for next 30 days, demand is 200 shoes. And now you look at sort of uh, inventory, which seem to have 99 shoes. And so you say, okay, go ahead and order 200 more shoes, okay? And so that's basically, you took a second, finally decision, but question that sort of still should be lurking in your mind as you made this decision is that, why 10 day, 30 day rule, okay? Should you order ev every time sort of the number of shoes on the shelf are left, which are less than eight days worth, should you order 40 days worth of shoes? Why not do that? Well, if you did that, for example, you are trying to keep inventory lean, not 10 days worth of inventory, but eight days worth of inventory. That's your sort of bottom line. So that's good because now you're being conservative, but then you're ordering 40 days worth, which means you might be investing a lot more. But maybe if the lead times are too far and you're 
forecast have higher uncertainty, maybe you do want to do that. Okay. So at the end of the day, what rule you choose might change higher amount of investment or lower amount of investment, and it might trade off against more revenue versus uh, less revenue. So what you really want to do is a rule like this 10 day, 30 day or 11 day, 29 day, that kind of interpretable, interpretable rule that you can pass on to somebody in organization who can actually implement it, implement it daily, powered with, of course, uh, some of the AI ML. But you want to sort of decide among all such possible rules, which one is in line with your business objective. For example, if you want to grow really aggressively, maybe you're okay to have higher investment because you want to get higher uh, revenues. But there's always a sort of a limitation of revenues that you can make. So you want to be careful of that. What is the, that Pareto boundary? What are those great operating points that you can sort of look at? And to do those things, you actually have to do scenario analysis. And these scenario analysis at the highest level in modern re, uh, AI jargon require you to do what I would call reinforcement learning. And again, so reinforcement learning with ease to use is not feasible. So really these are the steps that you have to take. You have to put some of these things in automation and all that stuff. And as you can see, here's just some examples of the tools I'm pointing out. Many of them are great at those individual tasks, but none of them is great at doing all of them together. And even if sort of they did that really at the end of the day, this is the state of affairs. Large number of system of records, large team sizes and large number of tools to, and then put all of them together to make it work. So at some level, one looks at this and one says, okay, it's clear what we need to do, but it's not clear how to do it. Okay. Uh, and again, even if you did that, you still have to sort of figure out how to uh, get the ground truth. As I explained, mapping skews to each other is not straightforward from last year to this year. Uh, because effectively schemas are not matching of some sort. And this is a pervasive problem. This problem shows up in financial industry as well. This problem shows up in insurance industry and many other places where you've got multiple sources of data to bring them together and to make one ground truth, you have to stitch them together. Uh, you have to make good predictions, not just forecast good predictions. And there's a constantly changing uh, aspect in this. So it's not one, one model is good enough and data is typically sparse for that reason. Question is how do you make good predictions with sparse data? And last but not the least, scenario analysis, as I mentioned, is about doing a number of simulations of reinforcement learning to make decisions. And again, there are multiple objectives. There's not one objective. So really you want to think about a new class of reinforcement learning questions. So doing all of these three things is what actually uh, uh, got excited, uh, got me excited uh, and need for doing this all the way end to end is what was sort of need of the time. So that's why sort of we came together and uh, uh, at MIT uh, with my former students and uh, collaborators, we developed three AI nuggets, the so deep match, deep cast and deep plan Deep match effectively takes uh, data sources like different spreadsheets, think of it that way, this is a mental model, and it manages to stitch them together, even if there may not be common uh, schema. Going back to that skew mapping, this black uh, sweater might be called a one, two, three last year and ABC this year, because there's a description or because there's an image or collection of other things that are common, it will be able to match them. Deep cast is, um, uh, is a forecasting uh, capability which uses very limited data, but stitches information across different data sources to make better predictions. Finally, deep plan is easy to use interpretable reinforcement learning that has capability to do large number of scenario analysis so that you can, as a user, tune these things and produce uh, meaningful answers. So what I want to do next is just explain a little bit about these three nuggets and then talk about how end-to-end uh, -end these things enable an end-to-end uh, no-code platform. 
And then, Shiva, I want to sort of show you how that can solve uh, this simple problem that I just started as an example of uh, deciding how to make a decision of ordering inventory day to day and just in one place. Okay. So, really, that is my plan for remaining uh, 50 to 20 minutes. Okay. Let's see if there are any questions. Okay. There are no questions that I'm going to continue moving forward. Okay, so uh, first I would just want to sort of give you a simple example, cartoon-like example of what Deep Match is doing. So as you're seeing here in animation, the GIF shows that, you know, let's say there are two, um, uh, there are two uh, tables, table one and table two. In one table, let's say you got a column called full name, which has uh, Jones, Angela, William Blake, et cetera, et cetera. In the another column, you have uh, some uh, another table, you have some other column, and maybe you're not calling it full name, you're calling it something else, okay? And, but that has sort of information like Jones A. And you look at Jones A, it looks like Jones A is like Angela Jones. Henry William, well, Henry Blake might be sort of uh, used by each other. So let's, this looks like together. Johnson, Matt, Matt Johnson looks right. Okay, maybe Brown and this. So you want sort of system to automatically understand this and match that. Okay, you and I as a human can do that. So of course, we hope machine can do that. Okay. So that is basically what I would call deep match. Now deep match in general is not, this is a very simple example, but more general, it might be a lot more complicated. They've got huge two spreadsheets one with ton of information on the left, ton of information on the right, and all information on the left collectively might determine all matching on the right. And that's the type of capability that deep match does. More generally, in an advanced version of deep match, what you might have is you know, accounts payable, account receivable. So think of, uh, um, uh, think of a situation where I'm sending you invoice for $100 and you are making me payments as $30, $30, $30, okay? So you paid me $90 in three installment. I gave you invoice one of $100, and now I have to match those things. And when I send you an invoice, I send you an invoice via, let's say, PDF or a, or a paper, and that's recorded in my system somewhere. When you send me payments, maybe payments came through a bank in a different system. So now I have to reconcile these things very classical accounting case, and typically you would end up doing manually. Things like deep match would enable do that automatically with human in the loop capabilities. Okay. Now I see that sort of there's a question that has come up on the Q and A. So let me sort of read the question and see if I can sort of answer it here. So, sir, do you believe Auto ML is going to completely end the job of ML engineer and data scientist? Uh, actually, not. Um, what uh, what M so auto ML is the way it's interpreted right now, right? Is only the small part of it. So, for example, this one is what auto ML is. Okay, uh, as one looks at it, is how do you build predictive models uh, quickly? Now, one thing is that there is. A, a, AutoML itself is not going to change anything. Tool like, tools like AutoML needs to be used, okay? So one way to think about it is that when spreadsheets came around, spreadsheets reduced the job of you doing manual mundane work using uh, data ledgers or paper ledgers, okay? But instead, what it did is that it enabled you to do more interesting higher level things that were not feasible before. So what's going to happen is that instead of ML engineers and data scientists constantly trying to write the same code over and over again for the same things, now they're going to use these things as a more higher level building blocks to do something else, okay? And I feel that that's where the highest value uh, will be provided both for individuals as well as organizations. It's like, it'll be very difficult for organizations to ask the question, so what is it that uh, data scientists do? Because I don't see any sort of uh, 
uh, impact of data scientists work on top line and bottom line? Well, data scientists are exactly going to help solve decision problems using data to improve your uh, institution or your business's returns on investments. Okay. And that's where there will be a clear understanding and clear association. So I feel that that's what's going to happen. Thank you for asking question. Okay. Uh, if there are other questions, please feel free to keep typing and I will keep monitoring. Coming to this uh, deep match, um, how does this uh, how do how does this teaching work so there's at the highest level uh, there's a, a method and technology called graphical models that we use just to explain in simple terms what i have done is i've taken a simple uh, uh, example here so imagine that you've got two spreadsheets spreadsheet one that looks that has two columns channel and purchase order or po and channel is shopify here for example and purchase orders for cherry blue. On another spreadsheet, you have supplier and order number. And supplier is somebody who is selling things like fusion and order number is called Excel cherry. So really this one and this one should be matched at least for us as human. And that's how I constructed this example. How does sort of a system figure out? So the way system does is, is as follows. It views every spreadsheet as collection of variables in this case, there's a channel and purchase order. On this case, it's supplier and order number. It learns the model between them using the data. And then from that, it figures out that this one purchase order column is like order number column. And within that specific row, cherry blue is like Excel cherry using all sorts of natural language processing and probabilistic construction and all that. And then it does this computation at scale. And to do the computation at scale, effectively, we had to build a new computational model called uh, computing uh, at scale for graphical models using pop sub algorithms. Uh, in simple terms, as an analogy, you can think of you know, just the way GPUs uh, enabled scalable computation for neural networks. This is our computational substrate that enables scalable computation for graphical models. And graphical models, at least mathematically, are neural networks on steroids. They're a lot more powerful than neural networks. So that's how we do this deep match at scale in real time. Okay. There's a nice uh, patent that we have filed uh, with my co-founder and CEO of Ikika Labs, Vinayak Ramesh. Uh, this is just a uh, quick snapshot of it. So if you want to sort of go and read about it, uh, do that. Now, is a nice question that somebody has asked here. Is deep match for na name entity recognition only? How is it different from normal NER model? So uh, short answer is no, it's not for only name re entity recognition. It's a lot very general. And I will show you the uh, a quick demo of that in a second, OK? Where I will show you how it can actually, from all sorts of disparate data, it can figure out how to match different SKUs from different season. And to do that, it's not doing name entity. It's a lot, doing a lot more complicated. Name entity turns out to be a special case of that. And hence, things like what NER model does is a very special instance of it. You can use deep match to do, let's say, trade reconciliation. You can do deep match to do uh, 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 financial transaction. You can do deep match to do insurance claims auditing uh, in an automated manner. So many such things, many such quotes and quotes, a reconciliation problem you can do with deep match that you can't do with otherwise. Okay. I hope that was helpful. The next, as I mentioned, is deep cast. Okay. Um, and I'll show you a nice example of this in a bit, but the highest level, um, if you use traditional time series model like Arima, Box, Jenkins, Hollywood, or whatever you call it, uh, and you have lots of volatility, these guys are going to pick up trend primary trend, but what you really want is to pick up variations as well. And that's what this deep casting does. Um, deep casting at the highest level, not only utilize information in time, but information in space as well. So basically the idea is that if you go to a, if you want to uh, predict sale of coffee, you can look at sale of uh, cookies uh, also at a coffee shop and then using them together, 
and maybe also chai. So using all of these things together, you can sort of figure out what good sales, what better sale model of forecasting model for coffee sale and a cookie sale and a chai sale. Okay. Uh, there's a nice uh, coverage on this, uh, which is easy to read on MIT News recently. Uh, there's an open source for just for these things that we had put out for some engineers if you want to use it. Or if you want a no code version of available, it's available out of API Labs with clicks. Um, all right. Uh, I think Aditya has, uh, and this is just sort of giving you a uh, visual. So why don't we sort of let, I'm, I'm going to let this uh, play for a second and then take Aditya's question. So Aditya's question is that what is your take on sales and analysis visualization for shopkeeper vendor? They cannot use tool like Bapula or Advanced without proper training. Uh, indeed, Aditya, that's why sort of we built this uh, tool like Hikai Labs, where our hope is that a lot of these things are like spreadsheets. So they're not advanced spreadsheet. They're easy to use spreadsheet things. Okay. And if your sales uh, is in sort of standard places, like data is in standard uh, platforms, this would plug and play on top of it. And that's why sort of the, uh, it'll be sort of a lower cost and things like that. Okay. Um, so what am I showing you here is last is what I would call deep plan that is uh, doing re interpretable reinforcement learning at scale. And the idea here is that, look, you know, um, at some level you do demand forecasting, but then the question is that how do you decide which of the different policies are the ones that you want to use? Some of these policies, if you're being very aggressive and keeping very lean inventory, you might be missing uh, sales. Um, and if you are sort of uh, keeping very aggressive, you might be missing very little sales, but you might be actually keeping very high amount of investment. Maybe this is your current operating point, which says that this is the amount of sales you are missing and this is the amount of inventory you are keeping. And maybe you want to operate somewhere here. Low, low miss sales or high revenue, but also very similar inventory level. And to figure this out, you might have to use different policy. How do you figure that policy out? Well, use historical data, use forecasting, and then do reinforcement learning on top to do that. And our platform enables um, uh, enables sort of doing this with no code uh, set. Okay. So um, in, in short, right, what a no code platform would help you do is to do all such things together to answer an end decision problem of how much inventory should you order every day? make strategic decision as well as tactical decision. Okay. Now I've got sort of few more minutes left. So what I'll do is that I will next show you um, uh, the tool Ikikai Labs that we built and how it can um, uh, do the demonstration of it. Uh, this is a company we founded three years ago. Uh, a great set of investors we have. Um, and let me sort of show you um, uh, these are the different uh, customers we work with. Um, and now what I want to do is that I want to sort of bring up my demonstration. So give me one second as I do this. So Mayank, uh, your question is that can uh, deep match use for share market analysis, right? So the question is that sort of uh, the, there are different aspects that you want to sort of think about for share market analysis. So one way you can think about it, if you have, think of different tickers that are changing over time, okay? If different tickers are changing over time and you want to uh, match information about them together, okay? Uh, or different types of information that's available that you want to stitch together and then sort of uh, use that to enable things, Yes, I think sort of um, you do want to sort of um, uh, use deep match, and that's how sort of you want to sort of collect. Uh, the question of anonymous here is that are the deep plan and uh, deep cast tool available at open source? So deep plan is not available at open source because it's a, uh, it's a serious undertaking in terms of infrastructure to enable it to make it happen. Uh, deep cast in terms of uh, time series analysis is available as an open source um, in uh, uh, through sort of TSPDB thing that I showed you. Now, okay, so with that, let me sort of uh, change my sharing and share uh, 
the demonstration. Okay, so I hope you guys can see my screen, okay? Let me see what you are able to see. And yes, you're able to see exactly what I want you to see. Okay, so what, he, what has happened here, okay? So as I was mentioning this skew issue, right? So I've just shown you a data that I've put through deep match where these are some of the skews from past year and this year. And the machine has been able to put them together. And I'm just showing you images here just to show that actually it has done the right thing, okay? So this is all looks good, okay? But it will, like any other AI, you know, uh, 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 AI um, exception is a norm, okay? So there will be things that will not be matched. But maybe you as, uh, because for example, maybe sort of, you know, there's a full text description, few other information that was there and it's missing. And maybe that's why these things are not matched. But you as a human look at maybe picture and say, okay, this looks good. And I think I'm happy to match them. And then things are matched. Once you're matched, all of that is done. You can save this. This means that there is a human in the loop component gets over. Now you want to apply, use this data and stitching together to you want to apply sort of deep cast. And then sort of you want to sort of uh, build um, uh, the next version, which is forecasting. So to do that forecasting, here is sort of a simple forecasting model that I uh, built. And let me sort of just, take away all of these things. Um, so if one thinks about uh, deep cast, so this is the purple line is the real thing. And then this uh, orange line is what deep cast is producing. Compare it with, uh, for example, Amazon's AR, which is primarily trying to do trending what with, with neural network. And it's just gonna forecast like this and miss out on the variation in the data. And that would, if we wanted to quantify, this is a loss of missed opportunity. If you feel that, you know, market has, uh, you, let's say right now it's predicting some days out, if you want to sort of predict a few more days out, this is sort of uh, how it will sort of expand it. So it's very easy to change those things. If you want to, let's say you feel that, you know, market is great right now, but I feel the recession is coming. So everything, all the sale forecasts that are made right now, should be discounted by maybe let's say 11% and then sort of you will get a new forecast. Okay, So all of these kind of human in the loop aspects that are directly available for you to uh, play with and this is the type of different dashboards that you work with that enables collaboration. You can put this in operations and when you put it in operations uh, it will sort of actually produce something like this. So this is like a strategic uh, uh, curve that I was mentioning. This is how currently inventory breakdown looks like. If you did historical simulations of your inventory using uh, deep plan, this is how sort of historic simulations look like. And let's say sort of if I choose this one, which is a current plan that is put into place, of course, there's no sort of uh, gain you have achieved because you've chosen the current plan. But now suppose instead, uh, this one is showing me that revenue is 11 million with average inventory of 700. Let me go and sort of use the similar things, similar revenue, but average inventory of one tenth of it effectively. And that means that sort of I'm able to increase my revenue by a little bit while keeping my investment one tenth of it. Okay. So this is the value at for increase of revenue. The value saved is like one tenth of it. And if you believe in that, Today's recommendation is that, hey, go ahead and sort of order this SKU by this much amount. You can send it to your ERP system, generate purchase order and whatnot. And to do this, this is the type of inventory simulation it used. So as you can see, if you ran this scheme on a historical data, you are effectively running down your inventory at these places, almost close to zero, but you're not running down fully. And that's why you're able to do the same thing. And this is the type of breakdown you will receive. So again, all of these things uh, are built using um, single, let's say a simple platform like uh, this Ikikai Labs, where this is my workplace. Uh, there was a demo that I was showing you where in the platform, in any project, you got basically 
three types of things that matter, ability to connect to all sorts of data, do something with data, and then build dashboards. If you want to do, if you build an ML model and you want to use this for service and operations, all ML ops related functionalities are here. These are the resources that are useful for collaborative pieces. So the marketplace where you can build something and share or others can build something for you. Uh, connectors, all sorts of connectors are out there. So if you have to connect to, for example, uh, uh, number of connectors, like hundreds of connectors are available out of the box. You just simply click connect and then data comes to you. You want to build your databases. You can simply build it here uh, uh, trivially. Data sets, you can upload, store, all of that stuff you can do. Uh, building flows, uh, like you know, combining things is as simple as doing something like this. It's a drag and drop stuff. And this is a, like entire workplace. Um, your data sets are available here. Your connectors are here, your database, you can search, you can do all sorts of advanced machine learning and all of that. Um, and then sort of dashboards and everything is built on your uh, right hand side. You can run, you can collaborate, you can schedule. So anything you really look for an end to end and data platform like this, you have those things available here. So I know that we're coming close to the end of the time. So let me do this, let me stop sharing uh, and use this as an opportunity to um, uh, look at some of the questions that might be there. So I'm gonna to try to pull up chat. Okay, so uh, Mayank's question is uh, uh, like the ticker data. Yes, indeed. Uh, ticker data, you can use it and so sort of stitch things together, yeah. Uh, uh, Farzana's question is that, is the free demo available? Um, yes, Farzana, you can just go online at, uh, let me just uh, type it here. So it's your, just go to uh, ikikailabs.io or ikikailab.com, let's say. And from there, you will be able to find the, the, find the ability to sign up for free demo. Um, anonymous attendees question, can it handle 5K products? Absolutely, uh, it's built for scale. Um, so really uh, it's easy to use, but behind the scene, it has power of cloud. So. Uh, very, very large jobs it can do at scale. Behind the scene, it runs uh, scalable compute using things like AnyScale, uh, which allows you to do large amount of scenario analysis and general computation uh, at scale. For, but the interface is very simple like spreadsheet. Aditya's question is, can these tools predict growth potential of certain products, like for example, demand or certain pattern? Um, uh, so Aditya, indeed, this platform has the ability to do uh, utilize computer vision. For example, the stitching that I showed you in the deep match, it both used image information, text information, and other things together. So uh, absolutely, that is feasible. Of course, it will data will tell you how good answers you will get. But whatever you want to do with data, the platform provides you ability to do that. Um, uh, I guess uh, there are no other questions. Oh yes, Mayang's question. Yes, indeed, uh, Ikikai is, uh, came out of the Japanese philosophy. As we were starting the company, we kept thinking what is the right name and we realized that you know this is going to be our passion for hopefully foreseeable future, if not forever. And uh, Ikikai sem seemed like the right name for a company, right thing for a reason why this is the first thing I'm doing in the morning after waking up today, for example. So really uh, excited to talk about that as well. Anyways, um, I know that sort of we have literally 30 seconds left. Uh, any other closing remarks from uh, uh, audience or uh, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much for such an active participation. Uh, thank you for connecting. I hope this was useful. Uh, if you uh, have any questions or comments, please do feel free to reach out and Maybe we could uh, bring the session to the end. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day.